Um, this first topic in this webinar series this year will be on biofortification uh, in a broader sense, but we also want to focus perhaps a bit more this time on what is called ergonomic can biofortification. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yeah. Ergonomic biofortification, so particularly the use also of fertilizers uh, to uh, improve the human nutrition through providing targeted micronutrients to the crop. So we'll hear more about this uh, later this afternoon. A few housekeeping rules very quickly at the beginning. Uh, this uh, will be recorded and the recordings as well as the PDFs of the presentations will be made available to you afterwards. Uh, we have the opportunity for you to uh, submit any questions as we go on with the presentations. Uh, please submit questions through the Q&A button down at the bottom of uh, Zoom, not the chat function. Uh, speakers may already answer some of the questions live uh, in writing, but we hope you also have a, a substantial amount of time then for discussion at the end, after we've run through all of the presentations to come back to uh, the questions that have been posed. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, del delay, I'd like to get started with some opening remarks, which will be given by uh, Mr. Jingyong Jia, the Director of the Plant Production and Protection Division of FAO. Please, Mr. Jia, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. And Archim, the facilitator, and dear participants and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this plant nutrition webinar series, which is co-organized by FEO Technical Network on Sustainable Crop Production and the International Fertilizer Association, AFAM. The objective of today's webinar are to increase awareness of the importance of agronomic biofortification to overcome heightened angry hunger and to enhance dialogue and stakeholders' involvement to sustainable use of fertilizer to surpass deficiency of mineral element content in the major crop. As you know that last year or 2021, the FEO and the AFA renewed all MOU outlining a way to strengthening the existing collaboration in the area of sustainable food and agricultural soil health and fertilizer statistic. Through this important partnership, FEO and the EFA will collaborate to submit awareness about the International Code of Conduct for the Sustainable Use and the Management of Fertilizers and the Fertilizer Code, we can see, as well as development to as well as develop and disseminate fertilizer statistic to increase food security and the safety and the efficient use of fertilizers. The importance of a partnership between the AO and the EFA has increased after current crisis, particularly the war of Ukraine. Therefore, we initiate a discussion for sharing knowledge and experience to update the key stakeholder about the change and the impact of the current situation in fertilizer market. And also, we are going to introduce or facilitate some discussion how to increase the, the fertilizer efficiency to deal with current situation. 
dear colleague. The year 2020 is the first year, 2022 is the first year for FEO to implement his strategic framework 2021 to 2031, this 10-year planning. The core business of this new framework for FEO is to support transition to agri-food system to be more efficient, inclusive, resilient, sustainable, for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. Leave no one behind. I am, I'm, everybody should know that. The better production is number one. It's fundamental for other three better better. So in, in, in accordance with that, the current today's webinar, increase the awareness of a better nutrition and better production to provide a better life in a better environment. So I can see this webinar is very, very important and also very much in time. And this P, uh, Production Protective Division, and this P, it support FEO strategic framework is mainly through we could be one better production project number one is better production. This means to support innovation for sustainable agriculture production. Here, the core business is to develop and the cropping system is a more green cropping system and then into better production and the through and optimization and the minimization. What is optimization? Optimization means to optimize all the positive perspective uh, aspect for the cropping system to make you know, better production and also minimize the, all the negative impact and the effect and effect in the cropping system. So to minimize all the negative impact to also gain better production. So now the key approach to implement FEO and priority program BP1 we hold is the OCOP. So let's say initiative. What is OCOP? OCOP is FEO Global, global action on green development of special agriculture products. And this means now we do one country, one priority program is OCOP. This will be very important tool for FEO to support bad production. We call it value added impact initiative. OCOP will be very good role also for fertilization and then for different special crop. This is not only for and the productivity, but also for nutrition. So in this case, I'm sure a bio-fortified committee called the president an example how BP1 and OCOP can add value to promote production, consumption, a sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and a sustainable marketing of a less special agriculture products, and therefore contributing to achieve FEO strategic framework, and of course, lastly, contribution to achieve SDGs. So today's webinar, I'm sure there will be very enriched the presentation and the discussion how this biofortification to support better production, better nutrition, and get better environment and better life. So I'm looking forward to learn more how can we optimize the positive aspect of a crop production system and the plant nutrition through agronomy biofortification and minimize micronutrient malnutrition in today's crop, in particularly the strategy to address deficiency in air 
vitamins, uh, vitamin A and the zinc, etc. I wish you all a very fruitful and enjoyable webinar. Say all. Over to you, facilitator. Akim. Thank you, Mr. Xia. So it is estimated that uh, worldwide about 2 billion people suffer from different forms of micronutrient deficiencies, some often also multiple forms. And many of them also are related to mineral elements uh, that uh, we consume through food and through also in particular plants that are grown to be eaten in one way or another by humans. So this is the focus uh, of today's seminar. And I'm very happy to have as a first speaker, Patricia Fracassi. She is a senior nutrition and food systems officer in the food and nutrition division of FAO. And she will give us a brief overview of the biofortification work that FAO does. Over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. And uh, good morning and good afternoon. I will now share my screen. Okay, I'm very pleased to be here to discuss the role of biofortification of common staple foods in addressing micronutrient deficiencies, also known as uh, hidden hunger. Biofortification is one of the essential elements to tackle hunger, as it allows food system to deliver more nutritious diets to vulnerable population without requiring significant changes in consumer behavior, with the potential to sustainably improve health outcomes, especially in low and middle income countries. Why is biofortification needed? 128 countries with comparable data on uh, report anemia, as a problem of public health significance. Anemia is in large part attributed to the to deficiency of iron and is estimated to contribute to 20% of maternal death. In addition to the hidden hunger, we know that 3 billion people around the world cannot afford a healthy diet which means a, a diet that um, is rich in variety of foods. The efficacy of biofortification in reducing micronutrient deficiency has been demonstrated through several studies, including iron uh, biofortified beans and pearl millet, vitamin A biofortified cassava, maize, and sweet potatoes. And the studies have demonstrated the impact of consumption of these crops on functional, cognitive, and health and productivity outcomes. So before we were mentioning uh, vitamin A biofortified crops and their importance to reduce vitamin A deficiency, iron fortified crops to reverse iron deficiency, and also zinc biofortified crops and the importance to reduce the susceptibility and duration of various illnesses. So, but there are many gaps in the planning and implementation of biofortification strategies. And one gap is the overall lack of usable data. So limited data on coverage and also on the dietary uh, contribution. When we talk about the nutritional adequacy of a diet, we are interested about individuals. And that is because uh, we know that there is a direct link between food consumption and nutritional adequacy. And this is more direct in the case of individual consumption data. Therefore, uh, FAO and WHO are collaborating to build a global individual food consumption data tool to better understand what people eat. And this is going to be really important when planning uh, this kind of strategies. 
Another gap is the lack of standards and limited regulation. And the role of the government is fundamental to ensure that new varieties of core staple crops have mandatory minimum level of nutrient content, that there is also a, that there are standards for micronutrient content of biofortified foods, and also to ensure the quality of seeds and inputs to farmers. So the standards are important to achieve impact. And there are also gaps in the inclusion of biofortification in policies and legislations. But there are also very positive examples from a variety of countries. For example, Indonesia has included high zinc rice in social safety net program. Guatemala has included biofortified crops as part of its COVID-19 economic uh, recovery plan. And the African Union has adopted a roadmap to guide 55 member states. So these are all important examples of supportive policies. And it's also important to address a gap in terms of the quality of implementation, if you want to really scale up uh, this type of strategy. And here there is a role to play by multiple stakeholders, not only the government, but the private sector and also development partner. So it's, it's important to have a variety of strategies. So supporting farmers with verified inputs and good agricultural practice, enhance traceability and market confidence, support the market for biofortified crops and support also market monitoring efforts and also increase consumers awareness and here the, the importance of food labeling to increase the visibility of biofortified crops. And there are also innovation in terms of developing affordable healthy food products with biofortified ingredients. And in terms of the fifth gap, which is limited integration in public programs, we really look here at the role of government, but also the support from development partners in ensuring that uh, this type of strategy really include the most vulnerable. And one could be through the integration of biofortified products in public support programs, such as food assistance and school meals. And the other one is really to ensure the inclusion of biofortified varieties in farmer-focused subsidy programs. And I would like to conclude just with the letter of agreement that we have signed with Harvest Plus uh, to um, support the scaling up of uh, biofortification. And uh, we have established a voluntary expert advisory group uh, to support the development and validation of an implementation guidance. Uh, this implementation guidance will benefit from a number of uh, case studies, building on existing practices and lessons learned. And we will add to this guidance note, a framework to guide the economic evaluation because that's really important when it comes to inform uh, the planning and financing of uh, biofortification. And I would like to conclude now with thanking you very much for this opportunity and reminding always that collaboration is key. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, and um, just to remind everybody, if you have questions related to Patricia's presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box or button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Patricia has already alluded to uh, some of the policy-related issues when it comes to upscaling innovations like biofortified crops. And we will now move a bit more into the agronomic space and fertilizer space, uh, because that's also, of course, uh, an opportunity for the fertilizer industry to contribute more directly to improving nutrition. And I'm very happy to have with us today, Professor Ismail Chakmak, who is the Professor of Plant Nutrition from Sabanchi University in Istanbul in Turkey. And I dare say, um, has been for a long time, 
working on the hidden hunger problem uh, from a plant nutrition point of view has been involved in many initiatives as i would say as a world authority for this uh, topic and he'll give you now an excellent overview of the problem and also some examples of the work that he's been involved with over to you ismail please unmute yourself so now the screen full screen yes uh, akim yep very Go ahead. good so akim um thank you very much uh, i am pleased uh, to be here today with the ifa and fao and uh, also the participants of this event so my talk is going to focus on the role of agronomic biofortification in enrichment of the food crops with micronutrients to address uh, the hidden hunger problem in human populations. First, I have to say uh, that uh, hidden hunger is old, but still persistent nutritional problem. It has been already mentioned, uh, uh, over 2 billion people suffer from mineral micronutrient deficiencies, such as zinc, iron, selenium, and iodine deficiency, which are responsible for a number of health complications, uh, such as impairments in immune system, physical development, and brain function. I think uh, most of you know very well that micronutrients have uh, very critical antiviral, antibacterial effects, impacts in our immune system. Did you know that our uh, uh, first international commitment, first international uh, statement to ending the hunger problem was made in 1943. And thereafter, number of similar global statement declaration have been made, number of conferences have been organized. And you see almost 80 years are over. And still today we have in, the, in our planet, uh, 800 million people suffering from regular hunger problem and over, over 2 billion people also existing which, uh, who are suffering from mineral micronutrient deficiency. I think this is a really, very really shameful situation for us. And the relevance and importance of micronutrient deficiency in human population uh, is also studied scientifically at least since early 60 years. So I am trying to say that the problem is very well known problem and documented problem, old problem, but still persists a problem. And hidden hunger is also represent an important economic burden for a number of countries. There are uh, publication which indicate that economic impact of micronutrient deficiencies, I mean, the hidden hunger problem is equivalent up to 5% of the GDP in number of developing countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the question is, hey, what is the reason? Uh, what, what are the main cause or reason of the hidden hunger? So I listed here three factors which are relevant to my talk today. So number one is related to amount of the phytoavailable micronutrients in cultivated soils. As you know, uh, the, the arable, the cultivated soils contain very low amount of plant available micronutrients for root uptake. And the second reason is related to the micronutrient depletion problem in cultivated soils. You know, the crops remove every year significant amount of the micronutrients from the soils. For example, maize, growing per hectare, remove every year almost 500 gram poor zinc. And how many farmers replenish the soils with micronutrients today? And therefore, after some time, their soils are depleted with micronutrients. And the third point is also very relevant, yeah? And the crop production and farming system today, also in the past, not designed with the aim to improve human nutrition and human health. You know, the main motivation today in crop production is just to increase the yield, to maximize the yield. And as you know, if you have, if you increase the yield, you cause dilution problem. You see here on slides, uh, which show the changes in wheat grain yield and grains in concentration in wheat grown in Rothamsted since 1845. And that is very uh, uh, clear to see that increase in grain yield, particularly after Green Revolution, we have a clear decline in grain concentration of the micronutrients. 
And other reports show same effect. And you see here historical changes in grain protein, iron and zinc concentration. All the time, there's a very clear decline in concentration of protein and micronutrients in cultivated uh, cereal crops. So we have uh, two deep problems actually here with micronutrients. The one is the depletion in soil by cropping. The other one is the dilution uh, of micronutrients in grain by increasing the grain yield. So hidden hunger in my first slides I highlighted, I need to say again, hidden hunger problem is still persistent problem. Despite of number of national and international projects completed, conducted in the past 50 years, despite of in number of international aid programs realized and, and conducted in different countries, and also the diverse of education and training programs have been realized. But still, the magnitude of the problems is high and very relevant. And what I am trying to say, agriculture and food policies implemented so far have simply not succeeded to address the hidden hunger problem sustainably, despite using larger amount of the resources and funds. Of course, there was some uh, 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 progress and success, but the methods used were not sustainable. Therefore, the problem is still persists a problem. So I, should, I have to say, none of the agriculture and food policies applied so far have included fertilizer-based solution, such as application of micronutrient containing fertilizer. In fact, in the past, and still today, fertilizer programs are being used and, uh, and considered in such uh, uh, in countries, but those fertilizer programs focus rather to to, to, to improve soil fertility, to improve the crop yields and profit of the farmers. However, little or no priority has been given to nutritional outcomes relevant to, uh, to, to hidden hunger. So again, if the micronutrients are low in the soils, in the cultivated soils, if the micronutrients are low in eligible part of the food crop, how the different agriculture and food policies will be successful in addressing hidden hunger problem in a sustainable way? So today I will show you a few case studies, plant nutrition based strategies, which, which demonstrate that the fertilizer strategy really very effective in increasing micronutrient concentration of the food crops to meet human needs for, for micronutrients. First, I would like to start with, uh, with the case study conducted in Finland. So I think, you know, um, in Finland, because of very low dietary selenium intake in Finland, the government has made a decision to enrich the old NPK fertilizer with selenium early 80 years. See what happens. So before enrichment of the fertilizer with selenium, yeah, it was the early 80 years, the grain selenium concentration was around or below 50 microgram per kilogram. After enrichment of the fertilizer with selenium, you, should, you see here, very significant, very nice increase in grain selenium concentration. Similar changes have been also found in serum or in plasma selenium concentration, or in silage concentration of, uh, of, of, of selenium or meat or other foods. So this, this, there was a very nice response of, of the different foods uh, uh, to selenium, uh, to use, uh, to application of selenium and rich MPK fertilizer. The amount of the fertilizer, I mean, selenium uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the soil is really very low. As you see here, uh, is, is around five gram per hectare is the, uh, of selenium is needed to improve sufficient grain selenium concentration. We have a same or similar situation story in Turkey. So, you know, earlier 90 years, in, uh, uh, we have seen the, often some poor growth, uh, some symptoms on cereals, on wheat growing in Anatolia. We didn't know the reason uh, initially, but later on we recognized the problem is related to the zinc deficiency. And then we start a number of field experiments in Anatolia, early 90 years, and we received a, a good fund, uh, financial support from NATO, from NATO Science Force Stability Division. And the, uh, and the results show impressive increases in plant growth in yield of the plant after application of zinc fertilizer. You see here what happens. Early 90 years, there was no zinc-containing fertilizer produced and applied in Turkey. 
But after this uh, NATO support zinc project, you see here what happens. The fertilizer industry responded very quickly, started to produce zinc containing fertilizer, and now we produce and apply around 600,000 zinc containing NPK fertilizer in Turkey. Of course, with the application of these fertilizer, we improve not only the yield, the, 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 the growth of the cereals, but at the same time, we increase the nutritional value, nutritional quality of the grain that we harvest in terms of at least the grain zinc. So you see here, in most of the fields treated with zinc fertilizer, we have found at least 50 up to 100% increases in grain zinc concentration. We made several uh, tests to understand which methods, uh, economic methods, application methods is effective to increase the grain zinc. And we have found that that leaf for your, I mean, for your application of zinc fertilizer uh, were more effective than the seed and soil application. As you see here, the soil application is still very effective in increasing the grain zinc concentration. Seed application, I mean, the coating the seed with zinc is not a good way to increase the grain zinc. Maybe it's a good way to increase the seed figure, seedling figure, but seed coating of, uh, with zinc uh, has no effect on the grain zinc concentration. But the foliar fertilization has huge impact on grain zinc concentration uh, of the cereals. Now I am moving to harvesting project that has been established on the Harvest Plus program. It started 2008 and then finished very recently to, in 2022. And this program has been conducted in almost in 15 countries under different agroecological conditions by using different cultivars. And I have to say this foliar fertilization of zinc doesn't matter in which country you are, doesn't matter in which region you are, works very well. And I will show you here some slides and some results from this project in China, India, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Turkey, and Zambia. There you see the average grain zinc concentration, concentration without zinc application is 27 micro, uh, milligram per kilogram. After four year application of zinc, you can almost double the grain zinc concentration. Irrespective of the countries or region, I mean, the, the effect is very clear uh, to see in those different regions. And is it also possible to, 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 to develop, to prepare a cocktail of micronutrient solution? You can make a solution containing zinc, iodine, selenium, and iron, and spray to the plants one or two times. As we've done here in China, India, Pakistan, South Africa, Mexico, Turkey, and you see by applying this mixed uh, uh, micronutrients cocktail of micronutrients, you can double almost zinc concentration again, or at least 75% increase in grains and concentration. Iodine concentration also increased, selenium also increased, iron short also some increase after application of cocktail micronutrients. So it, it showed that that for their application, uh, all uh, very effective irrespective of the region and countries. So the, you know, one of the question is, hey, where is where is the zinc? Yeah, in the grain. I think you know very well the zinc and most of the micronutrients, iron. They are mainly located localized in embryo part and allium part. I mean the, the brand part, the endosperm part is the part that we eat commonly. Uh, you know, the wheat grain is eaten after uh, milling. And we, we usually consume the endosperm part, the white flour. And white flour, as you see here, very low in zinc concentration, also in other micro, uh, concent of other microbes, for example, iron. So the question was how we can, uh, what happens with the endosperm zinc after polio spray of zinc? You see here, when you don't apply zinc, the, the zinc concentration in the endosperm part, see here the, along the arrow, yeah, this is the endosperm part, it's around five or below five milligram per kilogram. This is the zinc concentration that we eat every day in white bread, yeah, this is five ppm more or less. But after foliar application, you see, you can, you can improve the, the endosperm, I mean, flower zinc concentration very significantly up to two, three, four. This increase, I have to say, fantastic increase in terms of human nutrition, human health. And another point that I need to highlight today is the nitrogen fertilization, nitrogen nutrition. We have seen that nitrogen nutritional states of the plants is a key factor in enrichment of the food crops with zinc and iron. We have seen that that cereals, particular cereals, respond to zinc, iron fertilizer much, much better when their nitrogen nutritional status is sufficient. Here, one example or the reason behind, you know, there are, there are several uh, pathway uh, checkpoints, let's say, which affect the absorption and transportation, 
I mean, the root absorption and transportation of uh, micronutrients, I mean, zinc and iron from roots to the shoot, and then retranslocation of uh, zinc and iron from the shoot to the grain and the localization of micronutrients in the grain. All these are critical steps. All these are critical pathways are directly affected from nitrogen nutritional status of the plants. Also, sulfur nutritional status plants have uh, impact on those uh, steps. And therefore, I highlight that the nitrogen nutritional states of the plant extremely important to, to improve the micronutrient concentration of the plant. So here you see one example from China. In, uh, base, uh, the results are based on the 32 field experiments. As you see here, increased nitrogen fertilization, increased nicely grain zinc concentration. And as I said, that uh, nitrogen nutrition affects not only the root absorption, but also affect the retranslocation of the absorbed iron and zinc from the leaves to the grain. As is translocation, the allocation of the zinc and iron in the vegetative tissue to the grain is, is much better when the plants have uh, good uh, nitrogen nutrition. You see the here uh, results with good nitrogen nutrition plants almost deliver 70% of the existing, existing iron in the shoot to the grain. In case of low uh, nitrogen, it is 50 or 47%. I think you know very well uh, today in the world, there are some regions where you apply too much nitrogen. There are some regions where you apply very low nitrogen fertilizer like Sub-Saharan Africa. Sometimes I believe I think that very low use of nitrogen fertilizer, probably one of the main reasons for the well-known hidden hunger problem in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a point, uh, this is a challenging point that we need to think about. And when we are talking about the uh, 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 hidden hunger problem, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you heard about today Harvest Plus program, you know, Harvest Plus program after long-term successful breeding efforts started to release, to deliver zinc and iron biofortified maize, rice, wheat, genotype, and very good progress, yeah, successful progress that, that, uh, that the Harvest Plus program showed. And you know what we, uh, what we made in Harvesting Project, use those uh, harvest, uh, those biofortified, zinc biofortified wheat genotype, and, uh, and, uh, under, uh, and try to understand, hey, what is the reaction of these uh, zinc biofortified wheat genotypes to zinc fertilizer? And we have seen that those the zinc biofortified genotype respond very, very positively to zinc fertilizer more than, than the local cultures. So I am trying to say there's a, there's a, there's a, a kind of synergism between plant breeding and fertilizer strategy. And I suggest I have to highlight the synergism between breeding and fertilizer strategy it needs to be used extensively in future. So my conclusion is um, current management and production system are not able to provide sufficient micronutrients for optical dietary intake and for optimal human nutrition. And plant nutrition for, uh, offers, I mean, fertilizer strategy offers highly effective solution for hidden hunger problem. And this strategy, this plant nutrition strategy needs to be considered by policymakers but also by fertilizer industry. I think now it is the time to consider and integrate this fertilizer approach into ongoing regional and national human nutritional pro programs and policies to address the problems of hidden hunger. And my final point is, is considering the huge economic impacts of hidden hunger on GDP, on the economy of the countries in the developing world, incentive-based solutions should be implemented to encourage farmers to adopt agronomic biofortification strategy. So, I mean, my, my last slide uh, is, is highlights the focus on better food, not only just more food, yeah. Thank you. And I thank also the partners of the, uh, uh, global partners of the harvesting project in those 15 countries. Thanks. Thank you, Ismail, excellent overview. Uh, I've noticed that there is quite a few questions already in the Q&A box, so you may want to have a look there, including some specific ones that I'm sure you'll be happy to answer. Okay. We move on to uh, Professor Martin Broadley, who is a science director at Rossumstead Research in the United Kingdom, and he will talk about soil and fertilizer-based 
strategies to alleviate hidden hunger, which also means uh, introducing a relatively new term called uh, geonutrition and work that uh, he's been involved with in Africa, but also Pakistan. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, um, Akim. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. I actually pre-recorded uh, my talk because um, I didn't know what my um, internet connectivity would be today. Um, so I'm going to play the pre-recorded talk um, and I'll start now. Very well. Hello. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. My name is Martin Broadley. I'm based at Rothamsted Research in the United Kingdom, and I'm going to be talking about soil and fertilizer based strategies to alleviate hidden hunger. As we heard in the previous presentation, one of the most pressing micronutrient challenges is zinc. And these maps show the zinc supply and deficiency risks. The top map shows the zinc supply based on FAO food balance sheets combined with food composition data. And the map below shows the zinc deficiency risks. And what this highlights is the zinc deficiency risks and the prevalence of zinc deficiency risks are much greater in the global south. We can start to explore these data in a bit more detail if we go down to the national level. Here's an example for Malawi in which a secondary data analysis was conducted whereby uh, we looked at the food that people were reporting that they consume from dietary surveys, and we linked this with local food composition data. And from these maps, you can see that calcium deficiency risks are around 50% across the country of Malawi. Iron deficiency risks are at 18% across Malawi. If we look at other micronutrients such as iodine, in the absence of iodized salt, almost 100% of the population of Malawi is at risk for iodine deficiency. And then selenium and zinc are 74% and 57% deficiency risks, respectively. For the talk today, I'm going to focus largely on a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called Geo Nutrition. This project started about five years ago, and it involves a large number of partners from Malawi, Ethiopia, the UK, and international organizations from the CGIAR. The Geo Nutrition Project is exploring how the supply and receipt of food varies spatially, and it's operating and thinking about this at multiple scales across people, soils, crops, animals, trade, and health. And we're doing this so that we can map baseline deficiency risks so that we can explore the efficacy and effectiveness of interventions in terms of improving um, micronutrient deficiencies or reducing micronutrient deficiencies. We're thinking about agronomy, we're thinking about agronomic interventions to improve micronutrient supply in food systems. And we're also thinking about the wider context in terms of the socioeconomic, ethical and capacity strengthening contexts of the work. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the mapping of micronutrient deficiency risks, because this is critical when it comes to thinking about how we might go about alleviating these. We started this work in Malawi, working with the government who regularly conduct demographic and health surveys every four or five years in the country. The demographic and health survey teams work across the country looking at demographic and health indicators in all of these areas here that are colored in brown and purple. And in the area is colored in purple, they assess the micronutrient status of people in the villages in those areas. Now, this is a very large logistical operation with implementing partners such as UNICEF. Mobile laboratories are established in the villages and in these laboratories, teams of researchers collect urine and blood samples to analyze subsequently in the laboratories for micronutrient biomarkers. Blood samples are spun down in the field to uh, generate plasma and serum samples. And then these are frozen in mobile freezer units. 
Jalita Gondwe and Felix Piri work for the Ministry of Health in Malawi, and they were involved in coordinating these trials. And Felix was working on his PhD at the time to look at a different micronutrient that wasn't currently assessed in the Malawi Micronutrient Survey. And this element is selenium, this micronutrient, which is essential for animals, but not for plants, which makes it different to zinc. There are around 20 or so cellular protein genes encoded in the genomes of mammals, which we know have a range of functions, including lots of roles in health, including immunity, thyroid function, and cardiovascular health. And the work that Felix conducted as part of his PhD, using these um, samples and generating information from the survey, meant that we were able to map deficiency risks for the first time at a national level in Southern Africa. The map on the left shows the concentration of selenium in the plasma of people. And the map on the right shows the likelihood that the plasma selenium, in this case, in women of reproductive age, is below a specific threshold. The areas in blue on the map are where it is very unlikely that an individual will be below a particular threshold. The areas in red and pink means that it's very likely that an individual will be below a threshold. And the areas in grey are where it is uncertain based on the geostatistical analysis of these data. We then conducted a similar approach working with colleagues in Ethiopia. Adamu Bile, who was working for the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, and Daud Gashu, an academic in Addis Ababa University. Again, we looked at the National Micronutrient Survey that was being conducted in Ethiopia. And we were in, again able to look at selenium as a biomarker of selenium status at a national scale. And you can see in this map that the concentration of selenium in the plasma of people is higher in the Rift Valley area and up in certain areas of the north of Ethiopia. When we plot this on a map to show the likelihood of being below a threshold again, again for women of reproductive age, we can see that there is quite a strong spatial component to this. So this is an area, particularly in the west of Amara region and Aromia regions, where in these areas that are colored in brown, the likelihood of being below a threshold of sufficiency for selenium is very high, tending towards one. We conducted a similar analysis for zinc, and now across the national scale in Ethiopia, you can see that most of the area is colored in brown, meaning that it is very likely or virtually certain that an individual is below a threshold indicating zinc sufficiency. So from this, we can conclude that zinc deficiency is ubiquitous across the country, whereas selenium deficiency is spatially dependent on where it is that one is living. In the Geonutrition Project, we wanted to try and understand a little bit more about why this was the case. And so we started to work again with our national partners to establish what was happening in the food system in terms of the quality of soil and the quality of crops, in particular cereal crops that were growing on these soils. And this photograph shows uh, our national partners working in a teff field that's recently been harvested um, and, and threshing the teff to get the grain. And in the background, you can see um, colleagues sampling the soils in the same field. We did similar work in Malawi in 2018, working with smallholder farmers and securing consent such that they provided us with access to grain and soils from their farms. And this image now shows the field teams in Malawi. There were eight field teams in total that went out and were able to survey soils and crops in a rather narrow harvest window of around four or five weeks in the period of May and June 2018. Now, these maps show what that survey looks like. 
On the left, we have Ethiopia and we have the croplands, or the main cropland areas shaded in grey. And superimposed on that are these triangles. And these triangles represent different crop types. So the dark blue triangles represent maize, for example. The light blue triangles represent teff and the yellow triangles represent wheat. And you can see from this that Ethiopia has quite a diverse cereal system or set of cereal systems. If we look at Malawi on the right here, most of the triangles are in blue, dark blue, showing that most of the arable cropping area in Malawi is sown to maize. So it has a much less diverse cereal system than Ethiopia. Using a variety of geostatistical approaches, we can start to interpolate what we expect the likely concentration of a cereal grain is in a particular location. Here on the left, we have Ethiopia, and this is now the predicted wheat grain selenium concentration in wheat. And we can start to see some of these spatial trends where the light green is lower selenium concentrations in the grain and the dark green is higher selenium concentrations in the grain. For maize in Malawi, again, we can see similar spatial patterns. So these areas down in the south, for example, a darker green indicating that there is more selenium in the grain of the maize growing in these regions. We can convert these concentrations into what this might look like against a, an average requirement for that particular micronutrient. So in this case, again, for selenium, if we look at the yellow areas in these areas, person eating a typical um, wheat and teff diet would receive less than 20% of the average requirement from wheat and teff. If they were living in the areas where the orange or darker reds, then they would be getting over 80% of their average requirement of selenium uh, living in those areas from wheat and teff. And again, similarly over here for maize in Malawi. Now, some of those geostatistical maps are quite hard to interpret. And so we've been working again with geostatistical colleagues to try and understand how better to communicate these data. And this particular map shows the Amara, Aromia and Tigray regions of Ethiopia, which represent most of the cropland areas of Ethiopia. And what we've done here is we've mapped the average selenium concentration in teff grain at the district or warida level. So here we can see now from the from the lighter green to the darker green, you can see some of these trends uh, appearing, but it's now easier to see what regions and what areas we're talking about in terms of the average grain selenium, in this case for the tech crop. We can also then start to look at these grain concentration data and we can plot them. So we can plot grain selenium concentration on the x-axis here and we can look at the serum selenium concentration on the y-axis or the plasma selenium concentration here in the case of the Malawi data and we see that there is a very strong correlation between the grain selenium concentration and the blood plasma or serum selenium concentration indicating this linkage between what it is that people are eating and where they are living and the micronutrient concentration uh, that they have in their systems. So we can develop similar maps for other micronutrients, such as calcium here on the left and zinc here on the right. And this is for TEF on the upper maps and wheat on the lower maps. And this is for the Amara region of Ethiopia, again, mapped at the district or warida level. So if we look at the wheat zinc down here in the bottom right, you can see that those people living in the districts colored in lighter yellow are likely to be consuming wheat of around 20 parts per million. If you're living in the darker colored districts, then you're likely to be consuming wheat of around 26 to 28, 29 parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. So again, these are quite substantial differences in cereal dominated diets in terms of micronutrient intake. So these baselines are very important when we're thinking about efficacy and effectiveness of interventions to alleviate micronutrient malnutrition. I'd like to just briefly talk about a project also funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
which we're developing, which is to create a web hosted tool to estimate micronutrient deficiencies and to explore pathways to improve nutrition. Again, with partners in Malawi, Ethiopia and the US. The premise for this project is to try and unlock and to make available subnational insights of relevance to nutritional assessments, both now and under future scenarios, including how to assess the impact of new biofortified varieties of crops or fortification of food or agronomic practices that can change. This is just one illustration of the type of modeling work that's going on in the project from Kevin Tang and colleagues. And this is looking at a scenario again in Malawi where they're looking at vitamin A and they're looking at the enrichment of, of foodstuffs, in this case, uh, cooking oil with vitamin A. And we can see from these three different maps, these three scenarios, this is the status quo in the middle in terms of the prevalence of inadequacy. If there was no fortification, the prevalence of vitamin A inadequacy would increase substantially. If there was improved compliance with the fortification legislation, then there would be a decrease in inadequacy. And it's this type of modeling that MAP is undertaking. Of course, one of the um, key interventions that we've heard about um, from Ishmael is the impact of biofortification and the use of breeding and agronomic practices to generate crops that have a greater nutritional density in their edible portions. There have been many biofortified crops released um, globally. All of these are non-GM biofortified crops. And these cover a range of staples that are commonly consumed. We've been working with colleagues um, involved in the Harvest Plus program in Pakistan to look at G by E by M, look at genotype times environment time management on how this affects the concentration of zinc in the grain of these crops, in this case, particularly wheat. And we've been working with the private sector, in this case, Fauji Fertilizer Company, to start to understand underlying challenges such as low soil fertility in this case this is a map of soil zinc soil dtpa zinc where the areas in red are those that are virtually certain to be below a particular threshold for dtpa extractables this is work that we've been doing again with fauci fertilizer company to look at the impact of an introduction of a new biofortified variety of wheat in this case zincol 2016 and this is a survey of around 720 farmers in Punjab province, with the map on the right showing the likelihood of uh, zinc in the grain of wheat being below a threshold compared to the variety that the farmer is typically growing on their farm on the left. And you can see there's more blue on the map on the right, indicating that the growth of a biofortified variety of crop of wheat will improve the supply of zinc in the food system. For the final few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about agronomy, but I'm delighted to say that my colleague Grace um, Kangara will be speaking more about this shortly. So Grace will be talking about some of the integrated soil fertility management options, which can lead to improvements in micronutrient quality of grains. Other work by Simit have shown that again, the use of integrated soil fertility management, such as uh, green manures, can again improve the concentrations of micronutrients in the grains of crops grown at those sites. In terms of fertilizer use, we conducted a substantial amount of research with colleagues in Malawi to look at the potential for using selenium enriched fertilizers to improve the selenium concentration of maize grain in Malawi. And what we found was that it is remarkably simple to increase the selenium concentration of maize grain using a variety of different application methods. The red circles here represent a liquid drench of selenium, whereas the white and black circles represent different compounded uh, granulated products. And these amounts and these applications of selenium are very small to generate a substantial uplift in grain selenium. And as you may be aware, the use of selenium enriched fertilizers has a precedent 
in Finland at a national scale, where in the early 1980s, legislation was passed to add selenium to all fertilizers in Finland. And this led to a substantial increase in the plasma selenium concentration of the Finnish population. In 1992, the amount of selenium was reduced slightly in the fertilizers, leading to a decrease through to 1998 when it was increased again. So you can see the trend of fertilizer use, selenium fertilizer use, spanning this period on this graph here. And this continues to this day. And we contend that such approaches are going to be essential for addressing some of the micronutrient challenges that we see today globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, this worked really well. So again, have a look at the Q&A section. I'm sure there will be questions already. And that brings us to our final talk. I'm really happy to have with us today Grace Kangara. Grace is a research fellow at the uh, University of Zimbabwe and uh, Nottingham University in the UK. And she will actually talk about Zimbabwe. Over to you, Grace. Uh, your microphone is uh, not working. No, not yet. Thank you very much, Akim. Now, uh, now, I'll okay. be sharing my presentation now. I'd like to start by thanking the coordinators for the invitation. And I'm very glad to be here today to share my findings from Zimbabwe. I'll be presenting my topic today on advancing agronomic biofortification in Southern Africa. And this is from work which I largely did with the University of Zimbabwe. Allow me to say I'll be moving to Rotham State in June and I look forward to collaborating with the researchers at Rotham State Research. Uh, Zimbabwean population is around 15 million at the moment, uh, and 60% of this population is in smallholder farming systems. These systems have very strong livestock interactions where maize is the staple crop and cattle are regarded as a source of wealth and are important for meat and cattle manure provision. The soils in these smallholder farming systems are largely granitic sandy soils and they are highly leached in nature and they have a soil pH of less than uh, 4.5 and they occupy 60% of the land area. The other 30% of the land area is occupied by the rich dolerite derived clay soils which have larger soil pH and are more productive. So the, 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 the majority of the soils uh, which are sandy in nature, they are also deficient in essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, as well as zinc. Earlier work on zinc deficiency in Zimbabwe was conducted by Penelope Grant in 1981 when she was doing her studies in these sandy soils. In her, in a work, that's when zinc deficiency was first mentioned. Uh, and she alluded that sandy soils are predominantly deficient in zinc, in addition to the other nutrients that I mentioned earlier. Her work was then followed up by Fanny Tagwira, who did his work in this uh, soils as well, now looking at the effect of lime and phosphorus on growth yield and zinc status of maize. In his studies, he just assessed the availability of zinc in, in soils and did not look at any effect of zinc fertilizers and their contribution to yield. Work which was done by Shemi Zingore around the late 2000s looked at the um, soil physiochemical properties of soils collected from the outfields in Murewa district, which is a smallholder farming area and comparing them to the home fields, which often receive organic nutrient resources. And in his work, he showed that zinc is largely deficient in the sandy soils of the outfields compared to the sandy soils collected from the home fields, which are closer to the homestead. Now I'll focus on the work which I did in smallholder farming systems since 2008, when I was doing my master's 
and from 2015 when I was doing my PhD with the University of Zimbabwe. In our first work, in our work when we started, we started off with a survey where we collected soil samples and grain samples from 120 farms uh, uh, in two contrasting agroecological regions. So these uh, soils were then analyzed for zinc and the grain samples also analyzed for, for, for zinc concentration. Results from this work showed that the unfertilized fields and those fields which received only mineral nitrogen fertilizers had low plant available zinc of less than 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. In contrast, the fields uh, which grew maize after a legume, those are your typical legume cereal rotations, and also fields which receive organic nutrient resources at relatively larger soil zinc concentrations of more than 1.5 milligram per kilogram. Now this translated to increased maize grain zinc concentrations by 43%. So findings from this work show that pharmaceutical fertility management practices have an effect on soil zinc and also maize grain zinc concentration. We then also did another survey now on a relatively larger scale where we collected 350 samples from two contrasting agroecological regions as well. Mutasa district, which is highlighted in blue, is to the eastern part of Zimbabwe is, and is the high rainfall potential area of the country, which receives over a thousand millimeters of rainfall per annum from the months of November until the following year in April. And Weather District, on the other hand, is in natural region two of the country and is a medium rainfall area, receiving between 750 to around 800 millimeters per annum. So in this particular survey, we collected source samples to look at the effect of the district, which is whether it's a high rainfall area or a medium rainfall area, and also the effect of soil type, crop type, and we also included the effect of farmer management practices. Findings from this survey showed that there were larger soil zinc and iron concentration in Wetza, which is the medium rainfall area, compared to Mutasa, rain, Mutasa district. Soil type influenced soil iron, but not soil zinc concentration where larger concentrations were of iron were reported on clay soils than sandy soils. The field productivity level influenced soil zinc, but not soil iron concentration, where the most productive fields, which often receive organic nutrient resources, had larger soil zinc concentration compared to the least productive fields, which often do not receive organic nutrient resources. Crop type influence grain iron, but not zinc concentration, where larger concentrations of iron were measured in your typical small grains, which were finger millet and sorghum in this study, and also in cowpea, which is a grain legume, but not in maize. So maize had, had the least grain iron concentration. And lastly, food productivity level also influenced grain zinc but not grain iron concentration. I'll now zero in on the effect of uh, farmer productivity level on soil zinc and grain zinc concentration. I mentioned in my earlier slides that this survey was comparing the most productive fields and the least productive fields. So you will see in this figure that the most productive fields had larger soil iron, soil zinc concentration, and the least productive fuels had about half of that concentration. And this translated to about 13% increases in maize grain zinc concentration on the most productive fuels. As Martin mentioned, we were also doing field experiments alongside the surface which we were conducting looking at agronomic biofortification and its contribution to loading zinc and iron into maize, finger millet, and cowpea. 
So we started off by looking at effects of integrated soil fertility management, which is the core application of organic nutrient resources and mineral fertilizer, complemented with soil zinc, foliar zinc, or foliar iron fertilizer. So we were looking at the effect of cattle manure and also woodland leaf litter on zinc supply. Woodland leaf litter is, is a form of compost which farmers collect from the tropical Miombo woodlands and they compost it during the dry months and then they spread it into their fields. From our initial assessments, we measured the zinc in these organic nutrient resources. And our results showed that cattle manure and woodland leaf litter have substantial amounts of zinc, which could contribute to soil zinc supply and also grain zinc concentration. We were also looking at loading zinc and iron into maize, finger millet, and cowpea, as I mentioned earlier, through foliar fertilizers. These studies were done in the two study sites I showed you earlier in the moderate rainfall area and also in the high rainfall area of Mutasa district. I will zero in on results from the integrated soil fertility management trials. This table is comparing three treatments with and without zinc. The first one was mineral nitrogen fertilizer at recommended rates of 90 kilograms N and 26 kilograms of phosphorus with and without zinc. We will also have the cattle manure treatment with the same recommendation of mineral nitrogen fertilizer. Cattle manure was applied at five tons per hectare with and without zinc. And also the mineral NPK fertilizer and the woodland leaf litter with and without zinc. You will see that from this table, the largest grain zinc concentration of around 35 milligrams per kilogram was attained in maize, which was grown with the woodland leaf litter, mineral nitrogen, and with zinc. As you may know, the zinc that is required in the grain to result in meaningful intake of zinc by humans is between 40 to 60 milligrams per kilogram. So you will see from these findings that if farmers use their locally available uh, approaches and they supply zinc, they can be able to attain the recommended amount of zinc in their grain. Uh, it's also good to mention that uh, the integrated soil fertility management practices with zinc also reported an increase in yield of about 22%. Lastly, from the field experiments, I'll share findings from uh, two, two experiments which we set up to look at the effect of nitrogen fertilizer management on grain zinc. Uh, so in this work, we were looking at effect of nitrogen applied in the form of mineral fertilizer or nitrogen applied in the form of organic nutrient resources, in this case, cattle manure, or effect of nitrogen applied uh, as mineral and combination with organic nutrient resources. So these nitrogen fertilizers were applied at 30 kilograms and also at 90 kilograms of N. You will see from this figure that if farmers could apply 45 kilograms of mineral nitrogen, they can achieve grazing concentrations of about 40 milligrams per kilogram. Now, smallholder farming systems, they often face challenges of purchasing fertilizer because they have financial resource limitations. So in these farming systems, even with 45 kilograms of nitrogen, you can still uh, attain reasonable amounts of zinc in the maize grain. And however, we did not see any similar effects in cowpea. Uh, we, from the experiments and the surveys that we conducted, we then uh, wrote a paper to see the effect of 
farmer management on reducing dietary zinc deficiency. We did a disability adjusted life years calculation to see if the different management practices could result in reducing uh, dietary zinc deficiency in Zimbabwe. From the current intake of, of, of zinc in Zimbabwe, zinc deficiency is, uh, is, is it results in a loss of 12,000 disability adjusted life years. So if a person does not consume enough zinc, they are likely to suffer from uh, the, the different uh, diseases which uh, Professor Katmak mentioned earlier. So in Zimbabwe, that results in a loss of healthy years of around 12,000. But if farmers could use good soil fertility management, such as integrated soil fertility management, complementing them with zinc, they could reduce those uh, disability adjusted life years from 12,000 to around 3,000. So my findings show that it is important to use improved so fertility management practices in reducing deficiency. I'll finish off by sh um, sharing preliminary uh, progress on the Translating Geonutrition Project in Zimbabwe. This uh, is a follow-up work from the work which was presented earlier by Martin, conducted in Ethiopia and in Malawi. So we did similar work in Zimbabwe where we collected over 800 samples of soils and grain in six contrasting districts in Zimbabwe. We also collected forage samples and saw samples from grazing lands to see the zinc status in the forage that the livestock consume. So these samples are still being analyzed and we look forward to sharing our results soon. I'll just show you the progress of the sampling in these six districts, which was also done at the same amount of time of around four to five weeks as in Ethiopia and in Malawi. So uh, the, 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 the cereals which we collected were finger millet, maize, pearl millet, and sorghum, but the majority of them were maize samples. So I'll conclude by saying agronomic biofortification through integrated soil fertility management or micronutrient fertilizer and nitrogen management has the capacity to increase grain micronutrient concentration. It could potentially complement the ongoing genetic breeding efforts. However, there is a need for site-specific and not prescriptive micronutrient recommendations in different agroecological regions and in different soil types. I thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, we now still have about 10 minutes time to have a broader discussion. So I'd like to ask all of the speakers to turn on their uh, uh, video and uh, microphone again. I think what we have seen is that in the last years and decades, uh, a lot of scientific progress has been made. We have, I think, demonstrated the feasibility to enrich crops in a targeted manner with uh, certain micronutrients um, and either through genetic uh, improvement or breeding uh, or through the targeted use of fertilizers. I think a lot of this feasibility has been demonstrated in different crops for different nutrients. I think from what I've seen or we have seen in the presentations today, the solutions that are needed will have to be quite tailored to specific environmental conditions because the crops are different, the soils are different, the crop management, the climate may be different. So it, it really is a, then a matter of uh, packaging this well and also really targeting, targeting it to a specific uh, environment and even market segment. You know? So these are some of the lessons learned, I think. And now let's have a look at the, some of the remaining questions. I noticed that uh, about 24 of them have been um, answered already, so which is really great. But let's uh, look at a few other ones. Um, 
how helpful do you think uh, biostimulants could be to increase micronutrient uptake if for for example combined with adopted fertilizers maybe something for ismail to tackle i um, i came i didn't see any uh, any paper research uh, about this uh, topic so uh, i cannot answer this question uh, without knowing any uh, research based evidence yeah. so basically the answer is this is something we don't know much about yet yeah. which probably also relates to the, the general question that the biostimulants are more complex organic molecules for which the modes of actions are not easy to decipher and uh, but there's some indication that they have impact on nutrient use efficiency in plants in general but certainly an area to study more uh, there is a question um, uh, about zinc hole variety, uh, although Ismail is already typing an answer, I guess it's been observed that the yield could be lower as compared to other varieties, thus uh, potentially making it less acceptable by, to farmers for cultivation. Uh, Akim, we, we have conducted uh, uh, field trials in Pakistan by using zinc hole. And two years, uh, and in our results, I mean, uh, we have seen that, that the, the yield performance of zinc oil was not uh, lower than the common uh, mm. used uh, cultures like Kaiselabad, and even better. And uh, I know from the Harvest Plus programs, uh, the results also showing that, that the zinc oil is really doing very well. And therefore, uh, as I hear that the coverage of the zinc oil uh, in the country is growing. I mean, the cultivated area with zinc oil is growing. Yeah, I would also assume that, um, and that depends, of course, on uh, policies in the country, but um, many countries in Asia have uh, national guidelines for variety release that also require that a certain level of yield performance need to be demonstrated in variety trials under different conditions before any variety could be released. Do you know more, Martin? Um, so so there, there was a, another recent release in, in Pakistan, um, Akbar 2019. I was, I was just wondering if, if one of our um, audience from, from Pakistan might, might comment on, on whether the Akbar 2019 variety was, was, was yielding um, mm. effectively as well. So I think it's about, you know, the principle is really about mainstreaming the, 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 high, the high zinc traits into the into the into the wheat now, so so that there's a you know a whole um, schedule of, of of new varieties coming online. Yeah, and I think from a breeding point of view, that there there cannot be any trade off in terms of yield. Uh, you cannot compromise on that. Uh, so it's essentially additional nutritional value for at least the same level of yield, if not even a slight yield increase. <laughs> um, a question to Grace: um, If the pH was less than four point five, and when adding leaf litter. I assume this will increase the pH, which would mean that zinc uptake could be lowered. But in your study, the zinc uptake increased. Could you clarify that? Thank you for the question. Yes, I agree. Our soils have very low pH, and it could be the, the reason why the zinc uptake and also productivity is limited. And I agree that organics have the capacity to increase the soil pH and improve nutrient uptake. But like I mentioned uh, earlier that the, these resources also have zinc uh, when we measured them. So uh, we know that they cannot supply the zinc. Also, they can uh, improve soil uh, physical and chemical properties as well. Good. Um, and I would expect that if you put uh, any kind of organic materials on it, it, it will increase the pH maybe a little bit, which will actually improve zinc availability. You're obviously not entering uh, a territory where uh, of, high, of very high pH where uh, zinc availability would be less again. Yeah. Um, Good. Uh, another question for you, Grace. Um, am I correct in understanding that genotype by environment interactions affect the replicability of results, which would, of course, uh, detract from the efficiency of fertilizer applications as a biofortification method? Um, thank you, Akim. Uh, but I, I think I would want to pass that one to, to Martin, as they did work on G by Sorry, I was typing an answer then, so I didn't hear, I wasn't listening, I was typing an answer, <laughs> thanks, sorry. 
Can I answer Jang's first um, to say um, thank you for your comments? Um, I, I think the uh, involvement of the private sector is, is absolutely essential in terms of scaling um, uh, and, and thinking about agronomic biofortification. But I think there's a, a, an interesting nuance here as well. I think the private sector shouldn't necessarily be expected to be taking on board the um, the, the, the costs for, for kind of public health benefits um, mm. when they extend beyond yield. So there's a, I think there's an interesting um, blend of, of approaches that, that, that might be considered, um, whereby um, some of the some of the, 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 the costs can, can be, be taken on by the private sector where there are yield improvements, um, where there are um, non-yield improvements, but quality improvements. I think there's a, there's a strong role for, for, for government to, to work with the private sector on, on, on providing um, inputs for, for, for those benefits. The G by E question, Martin. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Um, You're not going to so get this, away without answering that one. <laughs> is this is this the one um, um, from Penny Southern? Um, yes. About yeah. Okay. So so yeah, it's a really good question. Um, we we see when we look at different landscape positions, um, for example, um, with multiple crop multiple crops and and zinc fertilizers, we see um, we see different responses in terms of both yield and and, and quality. And, and it's often um, those uh, sites that are that, that are on steeper slopes, um, so away from valley bottoms, in particular, where you have um, complex landscape cropping systems, such as in in, in Ethiopia. Um, we see a better performance of 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 the the crops growing on the on the steeper slopes in terms of their uh, quality response to, to zinc fertilizers. Um, it's likely that that will be um, greater than anything you'd see in terms of a variety effect. Um, uh, and, and so it's absolutely critical that, that we factor in um, G by E by M to, to all of these. So I don't think there's a, a single silver bullet here. We need to think about, um, about, about all the components to, to improve the nutritional quality outcome. Ismail? Uh, the G by E effect could be yeah, more relevant in case of soil application, but less relevant in case of foliar applications. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think uh, in general there are maybe situations where a, a broad solution, uh, like the Finnish solution, I call it, you know, a, a policy decision to say every fertilizer needs to have a bit of selenium, so that that may work in certain situations, you know, whereas in others you need to be much more specific, you know, in terms of the actual solution and. In some cases, you may have to go down to even a, a relatively smaller level of uh, uh, tailoring fertilizer plants to a more specific uh, larger environment. Yeah, I think everything of these uh, or anything of these uh, have a role to play uh, in this uh, in this whole picture. Uh, there's a question about zinc biofortification uh, in in chickpea. Uh, is it is it would it be in any way different from cereal biofortification processes? And is there any sort of leading program in this area and pulses biofortification? Uh, we we compared the uh, common bean with wheat, and it is correct. The, the response of the common bean to agronomic biofortification less than the cereals. Therefore, in my presentation, you will you will remember I highlight the cereals. Uh, respond much more to uh, 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 zinc fertilization. I think the reason is related to the uh, uh, overall low nitrogen protein concentration in the cereals compared to the dicos uh, legumes. You know, uh, the, the the nitrogen concentration is really key uh, when you when you you have still some room uh, to 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 improve the zinc concentration in the cereals by improving the nitrogen nutrition states of the plants. And, and Grace showed that, that, they, uh, that the response of the uh, um, nitrogen fertilization of cowpea was less compared to the cereals. I think the issue is related to the nitrogen states of the plants and cowpea and legumes. They are still doing getting nitrogen from the soil via the nitrogen fixation process, which probably affect the impact and, uh, of the agronomic biofortification uh, on 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 grain uh, on zinc accumulation in the grain or in the in the tissue, you know the the legumes are usually have more zinc than the cereals. When you analyze a soybean for zinc, it is more than thirty ppm, forty ppm. Even uh, sometimes we see sixty ppm. They are they have already high zinc, so there is really mm -hmm. little space or room to further increase the zinc in the in the in the grains in case of mm -hmm. legumes. 
Are there studies that show uh, how phosphorus and zinc uptake interfere with each other? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we work also a lot about that. Uh, yes, uh, it was also my uh, part of my PhD studies many, many years ago in Hohenheim. So uh, yes, phosphorus reduces zinc uptake. This is uh, very well known, but the reason is not related to the zinc phosphorus uh, precipitation. The reason is related to mycorrhizal uh, uh, colonization of the rules. You know, mycorrhizal is very uh, sensitive to high phosphorus. And mycorrhizal, this was a one, there was a question on, uh, uh, about this, and I am answering also this question. So so the, the question was, what is the role of microbes, soil microbes in the in biofortification? And I have to say, mycorrhiza is a key uh, microbes in the soils affecting zinc uptake of the plants. Mm. Up to 50% of the zinc accumulation in the plants maintained by mycorrhiza. And mycorrhiza is highly sensitive to phosphorus fertilization. Therefore, in, increasing the phosphorus fertilization would reduce the mycorrhiza activity in the soils. And therefore, we reduce the mycorrhizal dependent zinc uptake. So therefore, zinc containing phosphorus fertilizer would be one option, one solution to this problem. Good. There's a, a few more plant nutrition questions for the plant nutritionists here. For effective zinc uh, agronomic biofortification, is it necessary to have concomitant increase in protein content as there is a zinc protein association? Yeah, you know, zinc uh, protein is zinc for zinc. I mean, the higher the protein in the grain, usually to find higher zinc because uh, protein is a storage compound for, for zinc, yeah, like phytate. So uh, in cereals, you, you, we usually have less protein. Yeah, We can push the protein concentration in the grain and which, this, uh, which, uh, which could affect the absorption, transportation, and deposition of the zinc in the grain. So by manipulating the nitrogen nutrition status or by manipulating the protein concentration of the plants, we can manipulate the zinc and iron concentration, particularly in cereals. Nitrogen nutrition affects positively the uptake of zinc and iron. Do you see any differences between nitrates, ammonia, or urea as uh, nitrogen sources in that? Uh, we, we studied also this effect. I mean, we compared all form of nitrogen and found the nitrate nutrition is more relevant than ammonium. Normally, people said, Ismail, are, are you sure? Because ammonium fertilization uh, reduces the pH, uh, acidifies the rhizosphere, the plant should absorb more uh, iron and uh, uh, zinc. But it's not the case, I have to say. Mm. The nitrate is a key. The reason is very simple. The, uh, when you increase the nitri nitrate, uh, I mean, the nitrogen nutrition states of the plant by nitrate, application, you increase the negative charge within the tissue, within the cells. And this negative charge uh, uh, um, uh, encourages the plants to absorb more cationic nutrients. And zinc and iron uptake also stimulated by nitrate application. We published four or five uh, uh, papers about that, and two PhD studies have been conducted. Really, nitrate uh, has more uh, is more effective than the ammonium or urea in terms of uptake and accumulation of zinc and iron. The reason is related to the, uh, the charge uh, in the tissue because nitrate increase the negative charge, which stimulate the absorption of the cationic nutrients. Hmm. Good. I, I take one more question and, and then we have to bring this to a closure. Uh, could you please comment, maybe any of you, about manufacturing compound fertilizers containing both zinc and phosphorus? What would be some of the solutions or challenges there? Yeah, as I said, when you apply phosphorus alone, you may induce zinc deficiency just because of the reduction of the mycorrhizal activity. Therefore, the solution is apply zinc content fertilizer, a uh, zinc content phosphorus fertilizer. So this is my suggestion, yeah. yeah. Martin, do you have any other suggestions on that? Uh, no, other than, um, other than to look at the work of people like Mike McLaughlin, who've done a lot of work mm. on, um, on solubilization um, for, uh, of zinc phosphorus fertilizers. Good. Well, excellent. I think this has been a very, uh, very interesting seminar. Um, I appreciate the time that you've made available and also shown us some concrete examples. You know? So I think the challenge now is really how we can take these kinds of innovations to a larger scale and you know, make them work in a whole country or many countries, you know, which uh, is not something that uh, uh, anyone can do easily alone. It requires, the, in some cases, the right kind of policies, uh, but I think it also requires um, for the fertilizer industry and companies working in that sector to see this as a, a new opportunity 
to make a direct uh, contribution, not just to crop nutrition or crop yields and crop Im uh, agronomic crop improvement, but also through human uh, to human nutrition. Uh, we in IFA uh, have that uh, as one of our six uh, industry ambitions uh, for the next uh, two decades. We are at present exploring where we could establish some large scale case studies at the level of a whole country you know, to basically ask the question in this particular country, how, how, what is the opportunity for this and how would one go about it? What are the main intervention solutions, the, the product profiles needed for this? and who would need to do what and uh, what is the cost of it and in the end who who pays for that extra cost as martin has already alluded to yeah. these are difficult questions because obviously we cannot uh, uh, necessarily ask the the farmer to pay more uh, for a fertilizer that benefits the consumer <laughs> in the end you know so there is a a, a gap uh, there that needs to be uh, covered uh, by someone or some or buddy. And these are some of the practical questions that we will have to look at. I encourage um, anyone who has more interest in this to uh, get back to me or others uh, with any expressions of interest or, or questions or to the speakers directly. Um, I'm assuming that uh, those who registered for the webinar today will receive a message uh, pointing out where you can find the presentations and uh, recorded uh, talks. Yeah. And with that, uh, thank you all for joining and hope to see you again in a few months when we have our next FAO IFA webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah.